I believe um, Benjamin is the Deputy Chief of Missions at the Embassy of Israel in Washington, D.C., and he joins us to give us perspective on just the chaos, the devastation of what's going on in his beloved Israel. Thank you so much for joining us, and tell us where we are now, uh, Mr. Benjamin, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Armstrong. Thank you for having me on this, uh, on this show, and uh, good evening to all the viewers. Uh, we are now uh, at an event which started the Saturday morning, um, this past Saturday morning, 6.30 a.m. in Israel, which was basically Friday night, midnight, about midnight time here in the East Coast, with uh, people preparing to go to synagogue, uh, celebrate a Jewish holiday called Simchat Torah, join the Torah, the, the Jewish Bible. Um, and the um, people who wanted to go to synagogue found themselves dead, massacred, kidnapped. And instead of being able to joy and rejoice with their families during this day, during this important day and solemn day, they are now, quite a number of them, in captivity in Gaza, those who are still alive. We're talking about, to date, about 900 uh, people who have been killed we have thousands of people who are injured and the numbers are still going to grow because there are people that we haven't yet identified. They're still considered missing. This is the largest number of people killed per day. This is the largest massacre against Jews in a single day since the Holocaust. The largest number since the Holocaust. And this is in the Jewish land of Israel, the land of the Jewish people, the land of the Bible. And for doing what? for being Jews, for being Israelis, and it's not just Jews and Israelis, we're talking about foreigners as well, and people who are in Israel. Hamas, which is a terrorist organization, designated, by the way, also here in the United States and the European Union and other places around the world, without any provocation from Israel, without any reason, no provocation, no um, incitement from the Israeli side, decided to come like Daesh, like ISIS, in open vans, came and just gunned people down, men, women, children, elderly, taking a Holocaust survivor also, at least one that we know of, into captivity, into Gaza, slaughtering them, literally, things that we see and we've seen in ISIS. Do you think they organized this alone? Because it seemed to be so well planned, Mr. Benjamin. Look, Hamas, we all know, is backed by Iran, has very close relations with Iran, is funded by Iran, is trained by Iran, gets its, a lot of its uh, ammunition also from, uh, from Iran over the years. But Hamas has been around for too long. And now the world is seeing what Israel has been saying for so many years about who Hamas is and what it is and what they stand for. They stand for terrorism. And yes, this is part of the axis of evil, if you want, which is Hamas, it's Iran, it's Hezbollah, it's um, Islamic Jihad, it's ISIS, it's all of these. It's a whole network which is working together, which is not looking for anything but destruction and the killing of civilians and killing of innocent people for absolutely no reason. You know, we saw earlier where the UAE and other Arab nations have absolutely condemned this and has even put on hold the finances, like hundreds of millions of dollars that, that, that they've used to fund Hamas for humanitarian reasons. Many nations are saying they're putting this on hold. What should these nations do that realize that they send money to Hamas and we have no idea what it's being used for, but when you look at the death and destruction of the last 48 hours, should they reconsider? They should 100% reconsider, and they should understand that the money that they've been fun funneling to this organization is not going to the well-being of the Palestinians, the Palestinian people. This is going for the um, training of Hamas and for them being able to get more rockets and more grenades and more rifles and more ammunition to try and hit Israel. This is what they're doing, and this is where their money is going to, not to the wealth, real welfare of the, of the Palestinians. Israel is doing far more to the, for the welfare of the Palestinians than the Palestinians themselves are doing, led by Hamas in this regard. 
We've, we're, we've been allowing 20,000 workers daily coming out from Gaza into Israel to work in Israel. These are 20,000 families that are getting their money, their income through working in Israel. And what is Hamas doing? Taking some of this money and funneling this to, uh, towards terrorism. So absolutely, countries around the world, including the European Union and other countries as well that are funding Hamas, I think and now have their wake up call. Unfortunately, way too late for these hundreds of thousands, hundreds of, uh, of innocent people who were murdered brutally by Hamas. Well, obviously, public opinion, Mr. Benjamin, has absolutely switched and shown his sympathy and it's outraged for what has happened to the Israeli people. But what about the decent Palestinians who wanted no part of what their leadership has done, and they're paying the ultimate price? Because when your prime minister says that the response to this will reverberate for generations to come, that means many Palestinians will die as a result of the savages that they have uh, in their leadership. Armstrong, let, let's just remember that it's not Israel that declared war here. It's Hamas that instigated this, and it's Hamas that declared war on Israel. And the Palestinian people have one entity to blame. This is Hamas. This is their leadership. They're the ones in control, and they're the ones who also should be pointing the finger in the direction of Hamas and calling Hamas to stop from this. And this is the way to go about it. I don't think that anybody in their right mind can come and say to Israel after this, no, 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 hold, hold your horses on this one. This is Israel's 9-11, multiplied at least nine times if you make the, uh, the maths of the size of the population in Israel compared to what we have in the United States. We're talking about 900 people to date, close to 1,000 already, who have been murdered. This is unprecedented, and I remind us all that following, nine, following the 9-11 attacks here in, uh, in the States, how was the response of the international community? And how was the response first and foremost here in the United States? And then we saw what happened with, uh, with ISIS and the way that the, the entire world is chasing ISIS to this day. This is the way that we should all be treating and looking at, uh, at Hamas. Do you um, take issue with the fact that the Biden administration did release the $6 billion to um, Iran recently and they told him point blank, we're going to spin it any way that we like. Uh, uh, should we rethink our relationship with the Iranians? The Iranians stand also for one thing, and this is the Iranian leadership. We have nothing with the Iranian people. We used to have very good relations with the Iranian people, as, as, we, as we well remember. But the Iranian leadership as well is calling for the destruction of Israel. It's calling for the destruction of the United States. And it is working on a nuclear program, which is not a neutral one. It is not a civilian one. It is a military one. And there is only one reason they want that, and that's for destruction. Iran is standing for terrorism through uh, directly and then through proxies, whether it's Hezbollah, whether it's the Houthis, whether it's others around the world. And Hezbollah and, uh, and Iran is killing its own people and hanging its own people if we're talking about homosexuals or lesbians or whatever it might be that it's that is not uh, in the in, in the way that uh, that is liked and approved by uh, by the leadership of uh, of Iran and this is what Iran is about and we all need to be very very well aware of this including as i said earlier their ongoing support of Hamas you know, and Hezbollah and everything everybody else in the uh, in the area you know there was an impending deal between Israel and Saudi Arabia for Middle peace and Hamas attack is obviously is going to sabotage any opportunity that you are to move forward on what would have been an incredible uh, achievement um, uh, with Saudi Arabia. Is that all, by all accounts, just dead in the water? So I have uh, maybe somewhat of a surprise, hopefully a pleasant one for you, that I think that uh, in this regard as well, Hamas are, have achieving and are achieving and will achieve the exact opposite. There is no daylight between Israel and Saudi Arabia and other countries in the Gulf in the way that we see Iran and the way that we see Hamas and the way that we see all these other entities that are out there to kill us and harm, and harm all of us. So this is actually bringing us all closer together and it's going to bring us and the Saudis closer together as well and perhaps even faster than was planned before. While Hamas 
or maybe thinking that uh, a deal with uh, with Saudi is going to sideline them as as an entity, and maybe that was part of the reason behind their you know their thinking. This is actually going to bring about the exact opposite of it. It's going to bring a faster and closer and stronger relationship with countries across the region who uh, understand what Hamas stands for and who all want to fight against this terrorism, which today struck Israel in a severe, severe way, and tomorrow could strike any other country in the world. So what would it take to satisfy the Israeli people and his government um, to stop the missiles, to stop stop the brutality that we're about to see. What is it, your ultimate goal, where you would say this war is in it? And is it totally controlling Gaza? We know that you're shutting off the water supply, shutting down the infrastructure. We've, we've heard those, uh, those rumors coming out. But what will, it sa- what will it take to satisfy you to cease fire and say this government is now satisfied? Look, at this point in time, Armstrong, nobody's talking about uh, about a ceasefire. We are talking about, first and foremost, returning stability, calm, and security to the people of Israel. Up to now, we've had rounds of violence, as people used to call it. And then what we used to do is we, just, we used to put a, a Band-Aid or a patch on this to calm things down, hoping, perhaps, uh, thinking that uh, this is going to uh, to change things. But what we see now is that none of this has helped. On the contrary, this has just given Hamas more time to arm itself and to regroup. So what we're looking for doing now is to crushing Hamas as strongly and as fearfully as possible so that they never pick up their head again, not on their own people and, of course, not on Israelis. And that not just they, but everybody else, including Iran, including Hezbollah and any other entity uh, out there that is uh, interested in harming, whether it's Israelis or Americans or Saudis or anybody else will not think again or not or think think again much more whether to even uh, whether to even go down the, uh, down this route and will be very regretful of of ever even thinking about it. What do you say and this finally? Is clear, this is a clear message that has to get across. What do you say finally to these groups like Democracy for Socialism, where they? say they stand with Palestine and they sympathize with Palestine and these groups just seems to be so out of touch of the savagery and exactly what these, particularly for Americans, if they were in Israel at the time, just like the other Americans would have died, they could care less about your philosophy. They know nothing about what you believe. All they know is that you're either an American, uh, are you an Israeli, you're Jewish, and their goal is to kill you, to rape you and beat you and just destroy your way of life put you in captivity to use you as a negotiating tool. What do you say to these young people who are just, who are just, even after the attacks, even at the Harvard uh, Palestinian uh, organizations at Harvard University are blaming Israel and condemning them for, you for an attack that you did not provoke? Look, the level of hypocrisy which is out there by some of these groups is just uh, intolerable in so many different, uh, so many different ways. And I think we should all say and go out against these organizations as fiercely as possible because either they don't uh, they don't um, see what the reality is about which and maybe that's being a bit lenient towards them or they are just plainly supporting the terrorists and supporting Hamas by by these statements look we have Israel has nothing against the Palestinian people nothing whatsoever we have something with Hamas we have something with the Islamic Jihad we have something against those who are out there to kill us and this is very very clear and it's it's it, this is completely binary uh, completely completely clear and complicit to to all of us in a very very easy and simplistic way either you are peace seeking and you want to work together or you are out there to kill and murder civilians innocent civilians just because they're jewish just because they're israeli and we're seeing the rise of anti-semitism across the world including here by the way and for some people this is just another excuse so we need to come out in a very clear and loud voice as we are receiving and hearing and getting a very, very strong support from here in, within the United States, from Congress, from the administration, from communities across the country, left, right and center, with no regard or uh, regardless of the political affiliation of supporting Israel in its just fight right now and denouncing terrorism, denouncing extremism.
terrorism and giving Israel the backing that it needs to continue fighting terrorism on behalf of every single person in the free world, including here in the United States. This is our fight. This is your fight. We're all in this together. And this is a message that we all need to understand. And yes, also a message that needs to be passed across to those groups who think that they're speaking on, on in the name of human rights, but they're actually doing the exact opposite. The Honorable Eli Benjamin, um, Deputy Chief of Missions at the Embassy of Israel, thank you so much for your time, your countries and our prayers, um, and thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Armstrong. When we return, Cash Patel, Serena Potash, uh, and our CIA operative will join us, and we will continue our conversation. Cash Patel and our CIA operative, who's Ovin Erbel, joins us across the miles away. You know, Israel has a very delicate situation that mm -hmm. they must navigate cash. They have a hundred hostages. Mm -hmm. Families are scouring the cell phones, anything they can get their hands on. They have not heard one word, not one communication. And the last communication was having of them going into a tunnel in the Gaza Strip. You've got Americans in the same predicament, and other citizens. That's a tough situation. Are they still willing to blow the place up? Whether they get, can, can the hostages play in their psyche as they make these decisions? So having headed up uh, President Trump's hostage rescue efforts for some time, I can tell you this, when a terrorist organization gets just one American hostage, or just one hostage of an ally country, say like Israel, or a Western European country, they have all the leverage in the world against us unless and until there is a commander in chief in the United States who's willing to take them on in a multifaceted fashion. And what you see here is Joe Biden doing a drastically different approach to hostage negotiations by giving Iran, the number one state sponsor of terror, $6 billion. In the Trump administration, we got 54 hostages and detainees home, more than every president performed combined, and we spent zero dollars. Why I bring all this up is because the folks taking the hostages now know the price, the precedent that President Biden has set to saving just one, two, three, or four, or five of them. But that's They've, not Netanyahu. It's not Netanyahu, but who is Netanyahu going to turn to? Who is he turning to when they are about ready to unleash war onto Hamas and Iran? They're turning to the United States of America, and our citizens are some of those that have been killed, and as you pointed out, our citizens are some of those that have been taken hostage now in Israel. But it seems as though, and I don't want to say this, that it seems as though, Mr. Operative, that Netanyahu and his government is saying those hostages are just collateral damage. I think, I mean, they, they care deeply about those hostages, especially some of the, there's children and there's survivors of the Holocaust. I mean, the one, there's film of that. There's a lot of social media material that documents who's who's been taken i was stunned to see the fo footage of that lady who's in her 90s and i guess came out of survived germany with when she was four years old i mean the, this is in a large larger picture when you look at what's going on there people don't really understand the global islamic jihad is continuing on and the ISIS piece was one facet of a of a large globally supported effort by ra a lot of radical groups and and uh, states not a lot of states but certainly groups that are participating and i was more concerned watching and looking for details in the video on who who all had appeared there where are they from and there's a group their group representation from a lot of places and the, there, Israel's taking a lot of heat on this because they didn't detect it, but you, you have to be right 100% of the time. And these guys got lucky by getting in and the, the way they got in and the day that they did it, you know, it's just one of those things. It just happens. You don't have 100% security. You have as close as you can get to 100%. And the, but the Israelis have a long history of, of a, response that can be devastatingly precise and they combined people on the ground they just don't use aerial bombardment they put people on the ground and had people on the ground and they're 
their application of force is something that's quite impressive and I think unmatched as a state because they can deliver a tremendous blow right on things that matter with very little warning. They keep target packages stacked all the time so they don't have to spin up everything when something terrible happens they just have to turn things on refresh it and go let me and let that, me let that me got their legs on it now let me come back to cash um how much leeway will the united states and the international community give israel to do exactly what his prime minister is saying they're gonna, they're gonna take back gaza that is over I think the leeway is as much runway and roadway that the Israelis want and Prime Minister Netanyahu seeks uh, so long as it is a contained effort and doesn't spill out into other countries responding on behalf of Hezbollah or Hamas or Iran. What do I mean? Is China going to get involved, the CCP? What about Russia? What about other Middle Eastern terrorist organizations and Shia militia groups that are scattered throughout Western Europe? Are they going to get involved and are they going to get involved on our side of the ocean. That is a very real reality. The southern border is directly tied, in my opinion, to the war that has been launched by Hamas and Iran. They have been flooding our southern border with foreign terrorist organization affiliates for the last two plus years because it has been an open border policy in the United States of America. The Biden administration has admitted that it has lost track of at least two dozen known terrorist affiliates who have come in illegally. That's what they're telling us they know about who they've lost. How many of the 224,000 that come across every month are criminals, cartel members, and other terrorists? This situation is not um, piecemeal. It is going to come together on the global stage. And the leeway we give Prime Minister Netanyahu is going to depend on what the collective response is going to be from an Iran around the world through its surrogate insurgency campaigns. And I'm afraid that we in the U.S. in terms of intelligence collection standpoint, have completely deprioritized focusing on terrorist organizations. And as your colleague said, um, yeah, it's not 100 percent, 100 percent of the time, but it's 100 percent good and great when it's your number one priority. And I think this Biden administration intentionally decided to prioritize things like climate change, as we heard from the White House today, that that is the existential threat to the United States of the century. And I happen to disagree. Uh, Mr. Operative, how vulnerable are Americans? Well, Americans are sprinkled everywhere in the world. We have, you know, I can't think of a presence or a place where we don't have people there, whether they're dual nationals or tourists. And there's a lot of tourism in in, uh, Israel, as everybody understands. It's just a a place where it's a beautiful place to to visit. And the Holy Land is, is a powerful location on the earth and this this is a creates vulnerabilities in across the, the region because hamas they they've broken the mold on things that this was a you know a sort of self-restraint issue we haven't seen something like this before but this is a paradigm change where they they got into the country and i, I don't think there's a, a strong enough appreciation from across the board that 900 Israelis are are dead and an unknown number are missing and they haven't had that kind of death and destruction since the Holocaust. And I remember reading about that when Eisenhower said, get cameras here and record everything because 20 years from now, people will say it didn't happen. And we've had, we've gotten 75 years down the road and we still have atrocious racist and religious persecution against minorities. It's just a breathtaking uh, operational, bold operational assault. And I think Hamas is going to grow to regret this quickly. You know, speaking of, speak, you know, Iran has been, has always been Hamas's single largest sponsor uh, cash, providing 70% of the financing for Hamas, including upwards of $100 million in military aid every year, in addition to military training and humanitarian assistance. What else can we do in the United States to weaken Iran economically for its support of Hamas? And what steps should the United States take since it's likely that Iran has something to do with the attack uh, from Hamas, including coordinating and giving them permission to attack? 
Well, for starters, not giving them $6 billion. Joe Biden and his administration on 9-11 of this year returned $6 billion of frozen Iranian cash money from Korean bank accounts through the Middle East back to Iran. The president of Iran came out the next day and said, we will spend this money how we want. And they expelled the UN inspectors of the nuclear arms program in Iran. That's what happened on just one serve of the mm. Biden administration. And you want to talk about how you suffocate in Iran, you have to go back and put out a multilateral effort, but a multifaceted effort. That is sanctions. That is you use the United States sanctions program and levy our allies around the world and say, if you, Russia, do business with Iran, you are going to be on our sanctions list. Not just people, but companies and products. And cut them off from uh, the ability to trade with America. The next big thing is Iran has no banking system. They are run on a cash, literally, cash system of currency that is flown into Iran every single month from Russia and China. And now the United States uh, with that $6 billion. When you cut them off of that cash supply, when you cut off their access to the SWIFT banking system, that is how you start to put a stranglehold on Iran's ability to continue to finance Hamas and Hezbollah against Israel. But you have to have a commander in chief here in America willing to use all the tools in the toolbox to go after them. Sanctions and the banking system is just a piece of it. We need to be going after targeted operations of what we call tier one assets and start taking those guys out kinetically. I'm not saying put boots on the ground, but I haven't seen that response. That's the type of response I'm used to when somebody threatens us in this fashion. Mr. Operative, how will Egypt, Jordan, and the West Bank Palestinians Authority, Hezbollah, and other Arab nations respond? And what else are we not talking about here um, that's under the radar? I think the, the neighbors the, the, that border Israel and close to Israel are, are solidly on board with this, with their support of the Israeli response. They're all dealing with difficulties inside their own countries. And we've come a long way in the peace process in spite of every effort from malign states to, to destroy that peace process. So Iran is still quite isolated and alone. Hamas is their, their only friend. You know, I look back on the history, the, the leader of the Palestinian Authority and the Ayatollah go back into the 60s with their relationship and the, both of their attendance at the Patrice Lumumba University in 68. So it's, this isn't a surprise that they're connected. But this is a major connection and a major threat that is now going to be dealt with decisively. And I don't think they're going to come out of this intact and they'll be severely weakened by, by what they have launched against the Israelis. But the, the neighbors, I think the support is there. No one wants to see this. It shocked people here where I am, the ferocity of it. And unlike uh, we do in America, I think we we have a horrible policy of censoring the raw video and censoring truth that come from overseas here it's raw they just put it out there's no censorship at all here and people can see with their own eyes what is actually occurring and that has a, the ability to galvanize support because people that live here in, in the kurdish areas of iraq have suffered mightily under tyrannical leadership and brutality over the over the course of their lifetimes in the last 70 years so it's a fresh it's just a fresh reminder of the the neighbors not every neighbor wishes you well and the iranians continue to to just do destructive things throughout the theater and i i don't see how they're gonna come out of this okay well listen i cannot thank you enough for joining us from across the miles away in herbal when we come back serena potash who's literally on the ground in uh Israel. Uh, it's 3 a.m. in the morning there, and she's going to join us and just give us a blow-by-blow blow of what happened and what's uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, Mr. Operative, thank you for joining us. Cash and I will be back on Your Voice, Your Future. Um, you know, I, I have to tell you, Cash, I mean, it was so shocking watching this unfold and the level, the gliders, 
Mm. The gunmen on motorcycles. I mean, it's just... Now, you need to... People, so I've, I've been to Israel a number of times. This is only in the area of Sardat. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not in Jerusalem. But how were they able to make the Iron Dome malfunction so there was no detection? It's because they were coming in so quickly and they, what they were coming in was so small, they could not detect it. And in the process, they showed a weakness in the Iron Dome? <clears throat> yeah, I think we have oversold the capabilities of the Iron Dome mm -hmm. for far too long. There is no system on planet Earth that is 100% defensible of every single attack that's coordinated against you. That just doesn't exist. That's a fiction. Now the Iron Dome is one of the best systems in the world. But you have to look at the other side. You have to look at the enemy. It goes to the intelligence planning and preparation of those individuals over there. This is a months-long war that they have been planning for, if not months, years. And they have based it on ground level intelligence that they have been acquiring through the assistance of the Iranians and Hezbollah and Hamas and every other cooperator they have in the region, every other foreign terrorist organization. And what they did was map this thing out and pick a strategic time to go all in and exploit the evidence gaps, knowing that there will be critical failures. And that is somehow a surprise to everybody here in the United States of America that's working in the Biden administration. And what I mean by that is, how did we not detect that? Where was the IDF? Well, when you have, over the course of two and a half years now, the erosion of the intelligence database, what is it called? It's called the National Intelligence Priorities Framework, the NIPIF. Every commander in chief sets out the priorities that his National Defense Force will focus on every year. And but, but, but I got to tell you something, though. There's something very unique about this. This has been a regional war for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and Hamas has been given a lot of lip service of what they're going to do to Israel. They've talked about the very thing they're doing now. Mm -hmm. and, you know, even people in the Arab world, world just saw it as background noise. They ignored them because they never thought they had the capability of doing it. And so this is really, you know, we can say it's a failure of U.S. policy. Yes, to a certain extent. But still, this is an issue that Israel has been dealing with since the Treaty of Versailles, since the treaty, 1919, when they put the British put this in place without any thought of them putting all these enemies together, expecting them to get along, and it has never worked. That's my point. Now combine what you and I are saying, right? They have been, they, Israel, have been dealing with this. Us, the U.S., have been dealing with this for, what, 50-plus years? Yes. And they haven't launched an offensive of this capability. And I'm just saying the degradation of the intelligence community and defense apparatus doesn't happen overnight. It's a years-long decision-making process to continuously degrade and deprioritize mission sets such as Hamas. And I think, and I believe, it also happened in the SDF and Israel. Israel has had its own political upheavals in the last three years alone. Massive, Chaotic. Massive. Divided government. Chaotic. We have a prime minister who is out of government, who's back in government, and I'm not commenting one way or the other on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. I'm just saying that chaos internally there is only so much bandwidth. There are only so many people. There's only so much money, and there are only so much machines you can turn on to detect threats to your country. But you admit the country needs Netanyahu now. Oh, absolutely. I yeah. think as a partner for the United States of America, when we worked with him, when I worked with him in the Trump administration, he was one of our greatest partners. And I think that's the leader that that country needs in this time. I agree with that. But you can't. what you can't do is rewind the tape and say, we should have done these defensive measures one year ago, six months ago. And what you can't do, in my opinion, if you're Netanyahu, is have a knee-jerk reaction to try to make up for lost time. And that, I think, is going to be a true showing of leadership. If you can have the patience to combine the intelligence and get the allies together and then launch the appropriate style of attack, that will be the true test of leadership. You know, what no one is talking about, and I want to get, um, I've asked them to get our operative back on the line, is that probably one of the biggest losers in all this is Zelensky. <laughs> because his funding, yeah. his being on the world stage, uh, has been overshadowed by America's greatest ally. Uh, Mr. Operative? Yeah, you're right on that, uh, Armstrong. I think Zelensky is a, is the guy who's going to be a big loser in this and as the uh, pipeline of supplies and equipment and ammunition gets refocused in a different direction. But, 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 but we'll stop there. But if, if Zelensky loses, does that mean Russia is going to win? No, I don't think there's any big winner in 
in the Ukraine Russian fight, it's just the carve up of, you know, we, we go out after these things and we have a failed or flawed policy in the first opening salvo. And then we constantly try and correct that while we're engaged. And the, the Ukraine war is, is a very difficult thing that we, we, we stood by before it began. But once it begins, your policy options become much more limited and narrow. And then you're in a position of choosing the least damaging policy or the least disrupted, disruptive policy. I, I'm more, much more focused right now on what's going on in Israel because that has the potential to spill, spill big and spill all over because we, we don't know or at least those of us on the outside do not know if there is a secondary and a third stage and a fourth stage of operations that Iran has already turned on and put put in motion. We'll we'll see that in the next two or three days as the Israelis get their legs under them and start really hammering away at them at, in Gaza and other areas. They have good human, and they they can they can respond quickly. To, to opportunities to to decisively disrupt or grab people. They have lists that are active all the time. They have packages that are prepared all the time. And when something happens, they turn this stuff on. I don't expect a knee-jerk reaction. I, well, well, one I thing, see a methodical destruction. Well, one thing for certain, Cash, is that with all this, they have done nothing to weaken Israel militarily. Uh, nothing at all. Because this is like happening in just a neighborhood, mm -hmm. and it's and it's in this neighborhood. It is not spread to the real nerve centers of Israel. But a lot of people, so many people that we've spoken to since this, are really worried. Mm -hmm. They they just don't think this is going to end well for anyone. It's not. It's war. War doesn't end well unless you're the victor. And even when you're the victor, you're burying your dead. That's what war is, and that's just the human cost. You haven't factored in the, the economic devastation, the, the, the ruin that these cities and towns are going through, the familial generations that have been upended. And talking about what your colleague was referring to about um, not just the Ukraine and Russia, how about the other partner that the Iranians have that no one's talking about that is literally having a field day right now, the CCP? They're out there and no one's even looking at Taiwan. I mean, think about the bandwidth that we have as a global security posture. We were all focused on Ukraine, Russia, Russia, Ukraine, Ukraine, Russia, and then this war happens. And now we're focused on Ukraine, Russia a little bit and a lot on Israel and, and Iran and Hamas and even less ability to focus on what the CCP is doing to Taiwan and what the CCP is doing to facilitate an Iran. That's the whole kicker for them. They're going to come in, even though Israel is well-funded and uh, Hamas and Iran aren't as well-funded, the Chinese Communist Party is going to come in and foot the bill when it's appropriate because it will hurt American national security. But you don't interest. think they will make a move towards Taiwan in all this chaos? I don't know. We don't know. I don't know the answer. I didn't yeah. think this would happen. Yeah. Nobody thought this would happen. And now we are at, this is World War III. I don't care what name you want to call it. This is a world war. Our number one ally is fighting the number one state sponsor of terror and Shia militia groups and Americans are killed and being taken <laughs> hostage. It is a world war. You know, when we come back, Marion uh, Williams, presidential candidate, will join us. Cash will stay with us. We're going to say again, say goodbye to... Uh, operative who we just so much appreciate and thank you for getting up so early in the morning from herbal to join us mr. operative we look for back for to having more discussions with you as this continues to unfold thank you for joining us If you believe every child is deserving of a quality education, please go to educationjusticefoundation.com. You know, throughout my life, I've learned, learned, lean towards optimism, but I've also come to understand the importance of preparedness, to think of the worst possible scenario as we think about this discussion tonight. 
And this awareness prevents us from reliving painful episodes and descending into unavoidable disrepair. Reflecting on the war in Israel against savage terrorists, I can't help but draw parallels with the migrant situation unfolding in the United States, which we've sort of stepped around tonight during this conversation. Think about this. Every day, the United States witnesses a significant influx of migrants. While many come with hopes and dreams, it's undeniable that we lack a comprehensive understanding of everyone's past or intentions. The tragic events of 9-11 stand testament to how just a few can create devastation, loss of life, and destruction. There, a small, disjointed, militant group created the worst tragedy in recent U.S. history, and it caused a war at Iraq, it killed our economy, and it caused our government to pass some of the most onerous surveillance legislation in history. Israel is now facing a war because of another disjointed militant group that has invaded their nation. They allowed these same people to pass through Gaza freely every day and an unknown few have now killed over 1,000 Jews, Americans, Britons, French, and number not seen in one day since the Holocaust for Jews. Not a level happened because we couldn't gather intelligence on the group that perpetrated it, and our security was not as tight as maybe it is today. Who knows? But in Israel, I'll tell you this. The same is true. And I know Cash will agree with me when I say this. We must ask ourselves amidst the backdrop of the migrant crisis, could there too be individuals with malicious intentions seeking to exploit the situation? And as a nation, we need to enhance our border security threat measures and ensure that those arriving are thoroughly vetted. It's just common sense. We must ensure that when they are captured at the border, they stay there. They travel throughout the nation on public transportation, interacting with people in condensed areas. If a bad actor wanted to, they could undoubtedly cause havoc on our railways, on our aircrafts, on our infrastructure. And the thing, one thing is this, Cash, we must never forget that our duty first is to be, is to ensure the safety of our homeland. But the parallels are there. I couldn't agree with you more. And the, and the sad reality is, as we were talking at the top of the show, that when are we going to be struck? That's a question that we have to ask now. It's not an if. And I posted on an earlier interview today that I did about that specific question. When is a terrorist attack coming to the United States? And I'm not even on Twitter. And Elon Musk responded directly to my interview saying, it's only a matter of time. He's not wrong because of the situation you described at the southern border. Even if Joe Biden were to overnight build a thousand miles of wall and deport as many illegal immigrants as they could find, we have still left uh, two and a half years worth of a deluge into this country. And we don't know where most of them are. And I'm not saying they're all evil people. I'm saying the majority of them are good people. But some of them are criminals. Some of them rape children. Some of them kill senior citizens. Some of them flood our streets with Chinese fentanyl. And yes, some of them are terrorists. And they are well-funded and have patience and now see a dilapidated American intelligence and national security infrastructure system and one in Israel. And now you have a situation where the CCP, Russia, Iran, this new axis is combining forces and financing with foreign terrorist organizations. And they have been going, not started, they have been going at the United States through the southern border for the last two and a half plus years. So even if we were to turn everything on overnight, we would still be in jeopardy because of the disastrous weaponization of the national security apparatus by this administration. Do you believe the fact that we don't have a speaker of the House, it also adds a lot of uncertainty to what we're seeing now, that the House cannot issue some kind of resolution or support for Israel because of the chaos that the Democrats and the eight Republicans caused I by think, ousting the speaker. 
I think it will be used as a political cudgel. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there is going to be a momentous failure because we don't have a speaker immediately. And I also think we'll have one in short order. But right now, there's nothing that the House could do that will solve this situation immediately. They cannot, and we have to remind the audience, the Senate's not in town. They're not here. So even if the speaker was here, there's nothing the Senate's doing because Chuck Schumer sent them home. So there is no resolution of war. He's in China. There is no funding of war. Right. He's in China. He's in China. There is nothing. Th th nothing can happen. So it is a political distraction and a blame game, which I think is coming, that they'll say, oh, Republicans don't have a speaker and look what we could have done. No, what we could have done was issue single spending bills per, per department, per agency, to fund specific lines of effort. What to Matt Gates has been advocating. What Matt and other uh, yeah. Matt Gates and many others have mm -hmm. been advocating, instead of just an omnibus CR government growth expansion, and yes, it would be powerful to have a House resolution on on the matter from Congress. But I think what would be most powerful is if our Commander in Chief and the Executive Branch. That's who is in charge of defending this country when we need to go on offense. But gee, he's not there. Well, but, he has but, cognitive issues. No, we but I know. That. But that yeah, that, that begs the question: there. Who is Secretary of Defense? The chairman, the secretary of state, the director of the CIA. I haven't heard from any of these folks. Not one member of the national security mission has gone out there to appease the world that we are involved in going to help. So let me let me let me come back um, to this. We were talking about the speaker of the house. Um, you know, we heard today that only Kevin McCarthy has the votes to become speaker, not Jim Jordan. Not Steve Calise, mm -hmm. not Patrick Henry, but and that the Democrats would prefer him than what is being put forward now. Well, I, the political acumen lays over here with you uh, versus me, but I think you're probably right. The think about it. The Democrats they don't want a Jim Jordan, they don't want a Scalise. They they will probably go back. This is politics, politics and bedfellows, right? Where you talk about it all the time. We talk about how enemies get together overnight when it befits their political agenda, and that's what you see here happening. Of course, they don't want a a, a very conservative Jim Jordan or a very conservative Steve Scalise, but they might want a Kevin McCarthy back because they might have overshot. They, and, yes, and I think they did. And so it's going to be very interesting. And then you have this outside talk of airdropping President Trump in possibly to be an interim stopgap speaker. That would be ridiculous, But if I must say so myself. I'm just saying people He's are... He's running for president. People are talking about it. I'm not saying it's going That's to happen. That's desperate. I mean, this is why he endorsed Jim Jordan. I, I agree with yeah, you. Yeah, this is why he does. And in fact, he knows that's not realistic. Coming back to Israel, help us understand what will probably happen over the next several weeks. What they should be doing, and what I think they're doing, is looking retrospectively and looking prospectively. Retrospectively, how did this happen? Where did the gaps? Where do we need to, you know, sort of put bandages and gunshot wounds right now so we don't have another deluge of attacks? Prospectively, what are we doing with the intelligence and the defense mechanisms that we do have to go on offense to have this war be a short-term war? And how do we minimize the loss of civilian casualties? That's the things that you need to be looking at and asking questions of. And what Prime Minister Netanyahu is doing is getting ready and starting to take this offensive on the world stage and saying, where are you, UK? Where are you, France? Where are you, the United States of America and Canada? Where are you where so many Jews live in your countries and are protected by your freedoms and have direct ties to this, the most holy place, arguably, on planet Earth? But you do believe that funding for Ukraine is coming to a halt. I, I think funding to Ukraine should have come to a halt forever ago. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. the one rare guy that says if we have the ability to help others, we should after we take care of our own business, i.e. the southern border. And I think you're going to see a massive spigot in the defense industrial complex. And we've talked about this. Those guys are having a party across the Potomac right now because we're about to print some money. Isn't it true that the Middle East and their leaders have to be very careful in how much support they give to Israel as they condemn the actions of Hamas? Well, they have a very delicate situation. They have to play a very delicate situation. You've mm -hmm. seen some Middle Eastern countries go out and make public statements in support of the Muslim Brotherhood because they reside in their the countries. Country, that's right. And we talked about Egypt earlier, but we, for, we glossed over the fact that Mohamed Morsi was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood and he was jettisoned, yes, out of power. But there is a strong basis of support. So what is Egypt going to do, knowing that a large portion of the population is involved with that? And then what is, are our Middle Eastern allies going to do? I mean, remember, the largest recipient of money from the United States for purposes of aid 
outside of Ukraine now, is Egypt. It's been Egypt because of the Sinai Peninsula and the Suez Canal. So are we going to keep giving that money there? Is it going to go to Israel? And if that happens, what are the Middle Eastern partners going to do? They have an almost tougher tightrope to dance than the United States of America does. You know, I want to thank uh, Mr. Benjamin from the Deputy Chief of Missions at the Israeli Embassy for joining us and our operative, um, John Keyes. And also, it's always a pleasure having you in studio and people should really pay attention to what's happening in the world because literally it affects everything right now. Every aspect of our lives will be impacted how we go forward. And like you said, this is a, war this is a world war. Whether we call it that or yeah. not, that's the thing you need to take away. It's our strongest ally in the world, Israel. I'm Armstrong Williams. Thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Your Voice and Your Future. Have a good night.